I'm a feminist, but... Hello, Puff! And I'm a feminist, but... Someone just knocked on the stage door before the show and said, we've got a delivery of cupcakes for you. They've got slogans on them. And they're all things that you've said. And I looked in the bag and the first cupcake said, I'm an utter slut for equality. (laughs) And I thought, I'm sure I've never said that. (laughs) But I wish I had. And I will now. It does sound quite Australian, doesn't it? I'm an utter slut for equality. Was it Jesse and Mel? Jesse and Mel? Does it say, was it utter? Or was it absolute? Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. Even as I said that, I thought utter does sound a bit British, doesn't it? I'm an utter slut for equality. <laughs> utter slut. Utter slut. Absolute. I'm an absolute slut for equality. That's better. I'm a feminist, but... <laughs> My eldest daughter is just hitting adolescence, and I'm like... Yuck, I have to go through female body changes again. <laughs> you got to get your period a second time. Ah, it's good. I mean, pretty much, right? Yeah, yeah, all the I, PMT, all the first lot of PMT is the worst. But I've got, I've got friends who are really good at being like, it's really exciting what's happening to your body with their kids. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> I think she is can it- tell. <laughs> Is it exciting or is it just a lot of pain and It's beautiful, Deborah. It's about becoming a grown-up lady. I don't know. (laughs) I don't think it's beautiful. It wasn't. Certainly wasn't for me. Well, listen. Enjoy it a second time. Seriously, just as it starts to wind down for one generation, it starts up for the next. Do you know what someone told me recently? Uh, you know, we're, we're sort of biologically primed to have children much younger than we do these days because we think oh, we want to get a lot of feminism done first. And then, and then we end up having them really late. Someone said to me, I know that biologically you are meant to have them earlier. Do you know why? Because I know that you're not meant to have adolescence and menopause in the same house. <laughs> at the same time. It's just not meant to be. It's Can not I... meant to be. Can I add this as well? I look, I... Um... I <laughs> I will say this, I'm in my 40s and I've got plenty of energy for my kids. But I've realised <laughs> I left it too late for my parents. <laughs> they are furious that I let their best grandparent years pass them by. I <laughs> used to tell young women, put it off for as long as you can. And now I'm like, get them out while your parents still have the bone density to piggyback a toddler. <laughs> That's true. That's absolutely true. My favourite line from Motherland is when someone says, just get them a childminder. And she goes, no, I want my children to be raised like I was, by my mother. (laughs) I'm a feminist, but... Uh, Today I went to buy some running shoes, um, and, uh, and I was in platypus. And I know. (laughs) Um, I know all the lingo. Um, And uh, and I said, "Can I can I have these in a size six? And the woman working there said, "In a men's or a women?" And I said, "Is that different?" (laughs) Absolutely no idea. And she said, "Yeah." I said, oh, I guess, I guess, I guess they're women's. I mean, all, yeah, I was thinking, oh, all I, do, I mean, I only ever wear, I guess, unisex shoes, so I didn't know this. So I thought, I'm, I'm a size six. I guess I'm, I'm a woman. It'll be, let's go, w- women's, women's size six. <laughs> she brought the women's size six, and they did not fit. <laughs> and she brought the women's size seven, <laughs> and they did not fit. And, and I bought the women's size eight, and I thought, I'm a feminist, but... Have my feet just gone up two dress sizes? <laughs> so are we established that men's shoes, a men's six is a woman's eight? Is that, that's that a thing? I think so. Wow. Because yeah. normally, whenever there's a currency conversion, it's in their favour. Yeah. <laughs> so we've, 
We've, we've smashed the patriarchy oh, right yeah. there. Yeah. My eight is your six, yeah. sir. And I'm just looking in a general direction where I hope someone goes, yeah, I'm a sir. Um, any, any, uh, any cisgendered men in? Aww. <laughs> there's got to be more than that. It's Come good on. that they're proud, isn't Normally it? Normally there's like 20%. Any cisgendered men in? I promise I won't say anything to you. You can just declare yourself. One, two, three. There you are. They were just being shy. I can understand why. We could crush them. It would be like murder on the Orient Express. No one would go down for it. Um, uh, give, give us a chance of your sister and a straight man. What? You need to be doing more feminism. Bring your friends. Are you a sister and a straight man? Yeah. Um, and you, the soul rep, did you, everyone in Perth get together and say you're the one that's got to go? Or <laughs> you draw the short straw, you've got to do feminism. What's your name? Matt. That's all, why are you laughing at that? <laughs> uh, he's allowed to be called Matt. That's, 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 not, what do you do, Matt? Well, we'll, an engineer. We'll come back to you later. You're not the first engineer I've had this week. I'm a feminist, but we invited in Jesse and Mel because, you know, they had cupcakes. It seemed rude not to. And uh, I wanted to introduce them to the guests and stuff. And I said, did, did you make us biscuits last time? Because someone made us biscuits last time. And they went, no. We, uh, we came to the last Perth show. We saw that you got given biscuits, themed feminist biscuits from someone else. We thought we'll outdo them. <laughs> Had some pictures, said thank you very much. Off they went. Next thing we know, there's another knock at the door. I'm a feminist, but Perth, you're now my favourite city on the tour. <laughs> Warring cupcakes. <laughs> so jet lag mama brought the biscuits in the shape of our face last time. Oh my God, they've outdone themselves. I can't wait to show you. Vulva cookies. And a cookie called Suffragette, but make it burlesque. <laughs> and I think, Claire, they're our vulvas. I think last time they were our faces, and this time they're our vulvas. I can only assume. I'm a feminist, but looking at that cookie's the first time I've seen my vulva. <laughs> <laughs> feminist but sometimes I care more about time efficiency than my pleasure <laughs> yeah yeah now I'm important okay okay no it's important I enjoy myself wrap it up <laughs> yeah I understand that people yeah. are on a clock and it can take a while oh yeah I mean nothing <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> Have it wasn't it? the one I was going to do. Have you tried the Satisfy Pro 2000? Someone gave us that at a show in New Zealand. Um, did they write feminist slogans on it? No, it's not a cake. <laughs> I, I'm a feminist, uh, but um, since uh, in, in the UK they brought back the show Gladiators uh, this year, very exciting for me personally, and I'm a feminist, but what I've learned is um, that regrettably I, I am more enthusiastic um, about the women in Lycra than the women in sport element of it. That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah. You're I don't, watching I just, Gladiator to objectify the women. No, that, that, that wasn't how I started out. Petra's but missed the turn off with this game, hasn't she? Well, she's missed the turn off. She's going to have to find a way to do a 180 right here on the motorway. What I'm saying is there's a gladiator called Sabre and if you Google her, I rest my fucking case. All right, Perth? <laughs> Are we ready to start the show? <laughs> then welcome, welcome, welcome to the Guilty Feminist Live Tour Australia. And here we are. I'm Jeff Francis White with the Guilty Feminist. There we are. Timed that to perfection. 
Hello, Perth. How are you, gang? I've really missed you. Perth was one of my favourite shows on the last tour, and I haven't stopped thinking about it, to be honest, and I've wanted to come back and hug you all. Um, there was that whole thing last time where we weren't really meant to have people... In the, last time, if someone turned up with cupcakes, you couldn't have them in the dressing room because of the whole COVID, you know, it was all masks and, you know, don't get too close... Um, it, it, it made me feel unfeminist, to be honest, because someone comes backstage and they've made you something special and you just have to go, don't touch me! It makes you feel like you're Barbara Streisand or something like that. By the way, I am listening to her autobiography on audiobook. Obsessed. Has anyone else heard it? Yeah, it's not very feminist, it's amazing. Um, <laughs> it's just stories about everyone she slept with. And she's in her 80s now, so she doesn't give a fuck. And a lot of them are alive and she's just like, oh, he was an absolute bastard, but great in bed. And I'm just like, oh, God, I can't wait to be that old. But I feel like I need to quickly sleep with more celebrities. <laughs> so, so I've got some stories for the, the audiobook when I'm 85. Having said that, probably not all of them are true. And mine certainly won't be. Um, well, I'm plotting them now. Uh, just give us a cheer if you listen to The Guilty Feminist. <laughs> give, us, give us a cheer if you don't know what you're at. <laughs> wow. Um, you don't know what you're at? He doesn't, I do. Are you a couple? Oh, that's lovely. You've, you've brought him. Is he your partner? Or it's just a date? No, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> Holding on to him like he's a handbag in a crowded marketplace now. No, he's not available. He's very handsome. Um, so you listen and he doesn't. And you've not been able to convince him to listen at home, but you have been able to convince him to cross Perth to come out to a theatre. Oh, it's a five-minute walk. Okay. Well, as long as you haven't gone to any trouble. I've come from fucking London. Do you know how far that is? It's a five-minute walk. No British person wants to hear that. No Londoner wants to hear that. It's a five-minute walk for you, is it? Oh, my God. It went on and on and on. It's the second leg where you think you're two hours in and you think, I'd like to get off now. I don't think I want to go that badly. We cancel the tour, but there's nowhere to stop. You can't, you're just committed. You're in. You've, there's literally no way off, unless it's one of those ones where the door blows off. It's just... And you hope it's not that. Um, just give us a cheer if you've been to The Guilty Feminist before. <laughs> just give us a cheer if this is your first time out of the house. <laughs> not, 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 not at all. Just first time out of the house to come to us. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming. I hope you have a wonderful time. Um, oh, I, I should come to Matt, engineer. Um, is, this, is this your first time here? Do you listen to the show? No. Why have you come? My wife really loves the show. And interestingly, she sat you in the second row. <laughs> she wants you to learn something, Matt. She has notes for you. Um, I don't want to call you Mrs. Matt because this is a feminist show. What's your name? Jamie, Jamie. Is, would you say that Matt was a feminist? On a scale of one to very feminist, where is he? He'd be a seven. Interesting, Matt. Um, how do you feel about being a seven? Fine with it. He just went, yeah, fine with it. Fine with it. He's fine with it. That is the bar. That is the bar for men. They're told they're a seven out of ten and they're fine with it. They're like, there's no need to be an eight. I'm a white man. I've got seven plus privilege is... Oh, I'll fucking build a bridge here. I'm Matt the Engineer. He's fucking fine with it. He's thrilled with the seven and he isn't going to try harder. What number could you have got where you would have thought we need to talk about this? Six and a half. You really should have scored him. You should have scored him the way you score yourself. I mean, not you particularly, just women. We all score ourselves low. People acted like I'd sort of gone, I can see you don't score yourself well. How would I know how she scores herself? I just know how I score myself. And if I gave myself a seven, I would be crying. I'd be like, I'm only a seven. What's the point of getting out of bed if you're just going to be a seven? This is the thing, Matt. We've been told all our lives a seven isn't good enough. If you're a seven, a man will take your job. And in fact, yes, you're, you're very welcome to applaud that, but not just half of you. If you're going to applaud, 
come on, feminism. Come on, feminism. If you think, well, that idea is quite feminist, do you hear other people clapping? You can't just go, yeah, that idea is a seven. <laughs> I've told you I judge myself harshly. No clapping's fine. A seven out of ten clap, and I think that was no more than a five. No, we can't have it. Um, uh, so, Matt, what could you do, do you think, to be an eight? Is there anything you could do to be an eight? Need to learn more about it. Excellent. Good. Lock the doors. Um, so let's learn more about it. Anyone here think they've got a feminist job? Give us a cheer. And it doesn't have to be your job of work. You could be a volunteer position or something else that you're doing um, in Perth or the surrounds. Just give us a cheer if you've come from Perth. Yeah, we know you five minutes. Uh, give us a cheer if you've come from outside Perth. Oh, where have you come from? Bridgetown. I'm not sure why that's good, but that clap was a solid nine. I'm not sure. I don't know why I've asked, really. I don't know places that aren't Perth, near Perth. I know Western Australia, Perth. And I know one's in the other, but I'm not sure. Of course I do. I know Perth is the capital of Western Australia. That's right, isn't it? Um, so Bridgetown is how far away? How far has she come? I thought you were going to say three days then, and I thought that's so Australian. Just three days. Um, so five minutes, three days. Has anyone come less than five minutes or more than three days? Three hours. It's three hours, really. You've come from Sydney. We're going to Sydney. That's the next stop. Did you not know? You didn't come specially here, did you? Oh, okay. Thank God. Because that would be awkward because it's literally we're leaving for Sydney tomorrow. You can come in my suitcase. Seriously, that would be so awkward. So you just happened to be here or you thought we'll... We'll try and fit the trip in to catch it. Are you also going to see us in Sydney? It's a different show. No, you're not. You're, you're, no. It would be better, if, more impressive if you were. If it was like, yes, we're doing two cities, but don't also don't fly environment. Anyone else from not Bridgetown? Give us a cheer. Geraldton. Oh, they like Geraldton. They like Geraldton. How far is Geraldton, Bridgetown? More. More. Five hours. Five hours, lads. Five hours. They've put the effort in. They're like, she's flown 24, we'll drive five. Excellent. You walked five. Good for the environment. Yes. So is, is the party back at yours afterwards? Because everything in Perth shuts. It's a Monday night, to be fair to Perth. I can't expect it to be open just for me. But after the show, where's your house? Because these people want to party. They, they're going to be full of feminism at the end of this. They're going to be like... And Perth is, is not going to be open. So, but you're only five minutes away, so we could all walk back. How big is your place? Not this big. No, they won't all come, though. I've got the cupcakes, and I have got a fuckload of cupcakes. Um, so I just need to ask, does anyone do anything uh, non-feminist for their job? That you'd say, oh, this is not a very feminist job, just a chip? Yes, what's yours? You're all a, a postie and a limousine driver. So I'd say the postie, that's quite, and if you're listening internationally, that's a post... Um... <laughs> but I, got, I can't say man, though. Like, did you see I got stuck on man? I just went post... Don't say man, don't say man, don't say man. Person doesn't sound right. Post person, no one would say that. That's what was going through my head. I was going, this is a seven out of 10, Deborah. This is a seven out of 10. This is a seven out of 10 interaction with an audience member. You, you literally can't finish what they do. So you're a post worker, postal worker? Would you? Yes. I've thought, thank God no one noticed. Go away with that. Go away with that, baby. Postal worker. But lim postal worker, I think, is feminist. Yeah, people need to get stuff from A to B, and it's, it's uh, you know, there's lots of people who don't have the internet and, you know, need stuff. So I, I, I want you to be a postal worker. Limousine driver, is that mostly for cunts? <laughs> yeah, just that's what I would imagine. I don't want to assume. 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 Probably nice as well. Sometimes weddings and stuff, I would think, and they'd probably be quite nice. But lots of cunts, I would think. <laughs> if it's not a wedding... It, you had anyone famous in the back of your limo? 
All the people who own the wineries. How are they? How are they? They tip you a hundred bucks. Okay, all right. I don't know that that's unfeminist. Then, if you're just driving out, I mean, it's not. It's not pro-feminism to drive people who own wineries and can afford to give you a hundred dollars at the end of the. Tri- how rich are these people? Like honestly, but but I'm glad they're giving it to you. I'm sort of glad they. I I'm confused about the winery owners now. I feel like in some ways maybe they've planted their own grapes and people have liked their wine and they've done it with their own hands and maybe they're not exploiting anyone and they're kindly giving you $100, but why are they in a limousine? It's very confusing. Um, anyone do anything less feminist than that? Yes? Posty, you used to be a freight truck driver. These are male-dominated in professions. These, you're representing a freight train driver. I want to know about women in freight train driving. You're a train driver, for God's sake. That's like what little boys are told to want and girls aren't told to want to be a... T- it's always Thomas the Tank Engine. It's never, you know, Thomasina, is it? <laughs> are there girl ones on that? I don't know. I don't have children. Um, I think that's wonderful. So there's no unfeminist jobs here because normally someone says, oh, I you know, make money for lawyers and or something like that. Um, and they end up doing Trojan Hall stuff. Yes? You're a counsellor. Is this the least feminist we can do? <laughs> I'm a counsellor. Guys. This is not a 7 out of 10 audience. <laughs> this is the worst we can do. I'm a counsellor. But, but, but it's for family court, did you say? Yeah. yeah but some, but you're, you're helping them though, right? Oh, okay. So sometimes you're... But I want someone to counsel those people. I don't want those people to be left out and structurally isolated. I want them to have help and build empathy. So I think that's the most incredibly feminist job and incredibly self-sacrificing job. Big round of applause. Um, Anyone doing anything feminist here in Perth? Yes. Yes, what are you doing? One eight hundred respect line. What's one eight hundred respect? It sounds feminist. It sounds R E S P E C T. Do you ring up if you're having a bad day and someone sings R E S P E C T? That is what you meet it, and you just work yourself up into a feminist power, sort of, and and then you just say thanks and hang up. Is it? It's not. Are you kidding? Oh God! I thought, wow, what if it was that? What What's it for? Oh, wow. Okay, so first responder. So if, if a woman is experiencing domestic violence or sexual violence, she can call you. That's incredible. That's incredible. So it's 1-800-RESPECT. And do you need volunteers? Okay, and do they need money? Okay, so you could people could donate? It's so one run by Telstra. You need nothing. You're just being feminist on your own. <laughs> Normally, anyone running something called 1800, well, in the UK, if you're running something called 1800 Respect, and it was for women who were survivors of anything needing help, you would need money. But I love that here, Telstra saying, we'll sponsor that. <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, they must have a motive, though, the Telstra. Um, <laughs> I don't trust it. I don't trust it, but I like that it's there. Was, it someone else, was someone else wanting to tell me about a sports bar? Yes! Hello, what's your name? Say it again. Aiden, come down the front, Aiden. Big round of applause for Aiden. Aiden emailed ahead of time so I, and said that, that, that she really wanted to tell me about a sports bar. So, Aiden, I'm going to give you the mic, okay? Excellent. Thank you. Hi, thanks. My name's Aiden. And it's my dream to open a women's sports bar. Uh, We don't have one, but I think it's time that we did. Uh, The idea is to exclusively show women's sports in the bar. Wow, that's so wonderful. What's it going to be called? Well, we haven't got a name yet. Well, your name's Eden, so I feel it should be Paradise. I've got an email address. Yes, you've got got an, an address? Yeah. 
If oh. everyone wanted to, anyone wants to collaborate, I'm looking yes. to start it up. Um, the email address is WSB Women's Sports Bar, WSB Perth at gmail.com. WSB Perth at gmail.com. Do you know where you want it to be? Which part of Perth? Uh, I haven't decided. It, wherever the opportunity takes us. And do you need money? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> so you need money, you need collaborators, you need people who want to start a bar with you, a sports right. bar. So women come in and there's always women's sport on the television. Correct. And you, are you going to do... Exclusively. Exclusively. Yes. And you're going to do stuff with women's sports teams, I imagine? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, think it's a thing. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will be there. Next time we're in town, I want the bar to be open. And can you keep it open after the show? <laughs> okay. Because those guys are going to get really sick of us coming over to them. Um, okay. So, WSB Perth... Um, at gmail.com gmail. yes. drop Eden a line if you want to get involved thank you, thank you Eden. <laughs> all right I think we're ready to start the meat and potatoes of our show but not, if you're vegan the soy based product <laughs> potatoes of our show um, please be more plant based uh, so please let me welcome back to the stage my co-pilot for this evening it's the incredible Claire Hooper <laughs> Claire, my darling. Hello. It's so wonderful to be working with you again. Thank you so much for coming to do this. Thank you so much for having me. This is my hometown. So I know. I think I asked you, didn't I? I said, I, I, I said could I please do Perth so I can see <laughs> mum and dad as well. That's right. That's right. The only reason we're here, to be honest, we weren't sure Perth was going to be on the tour, and then Claire said, I need to see my mum. And so we popped it on. That's not true. Of course we would have come. Come anyway, but can, can we get into the cupcakes? Because I just have to. Oh, okay. gosh, yeah. So this, these ones, do you want to see what they say? This one says, what does this say? Okay, so guilty feminist 24. Real queens fix each other's crowns. Uh, women don't owe men shit. Look, I mean, unless there has been a fair exchange of goods or services. Like, I do. Within reason. <laughs> Yeah, obviously, if you've bought a man's car and you've not paid for Pay it yet, man. you legally owe him shit. You can't, if, you've, if, you've, if, you've, if you've paid him to like build your house, can't just give him that cupcake. It won't work. It won't hold up in a court of law, that will it? Um, I've got, do my nipples offend you? I think it's a fair question. And the answer is no. Uh, well, you haven't seen him yet. <laughs> the night is young, Perth. I've got here absolute slut for human rights, uh, for equality, equal rights, sorry. And uh, light up girls, time to burn down male ego. Oh, that one's quite spicy. That's a lot isn't it? to write on one cupcake. It's quite spicy. Quite spicy. Listen, I'm all right with your ego if you're a man, Matt. But, <laughs> but you know, I, I just want it to be. A, I, I, I'm happy to have you if you have a big ego, as long as you also have big, large self esteem. I find it that when someone has a big ego and low self-esteem, that's when they start blaming you for things. Do you know what I mean by that? If someone's like really insecure, but they're like, it's all, they're the main character, but they're really insecure, that's when they start crashing around. So you want big ego, big self-esteem, which I am getting that sense from Matt. <laughs> I think Matt absolutely knows who he is. He's sure about himself. He doesn't mind that he's a seven out of 10 because he feels, I'm sure he's not a seven out of 10 in everything. God, you're so sensitive for him. He doesn't mind. He's, he's solid as a rock. That's the whole point. We're all 7 out of 10 in some things. Come on. Do you know my husband... Everybody wants to hear about my husband. At I do, actually. My husband was banned from my work events for 10 years after telling an important work contact after a few drinks to their face that they were a 7 out of 10. <laughs> Like, you don't get the free drinks anymore, mister. <laughs> wow. Can you imagine? I can't imagine, and I'm horrified. <laughs> and he should, I'm amazed he's been allowed back after 10 years. That yeah. would have been a life oh, sentence for me. Would it have been? Throw away that key. <laughs> hey, Tom's listening. Um, this is, this is a, a fruit message for Claire. That's for you. 
That's based on a piece of your stand-up, isn't it? I know. It's one, yeah, that's one of this my favourite bits of stand-up. This is Jet Lag Mama now. This is, this is the war in cupcakes. This is the sharks. And the, we've got a bag of treats made by the sharks and the jets of the Perth feminist community. <laughs> Box of snacking vulvas. <laughs> then it says, sorry, Grace. I'm not sure why. I think maybe it's because Grace has said before that she doesn't... She finds edible genitals a little creepy. Is that, is that why? Yes. So you remembered that and you made them anyway. Wow. Grace, are you there? No, I, she's usually in the wings, but she must have popped downstairs. Um, and then this is, hi, DFW, Grace and Claire. Thanks for c- coming back to Perth. And is this... What I don't quite understand about this, this is these are sort of a it's, a... it's a couple going out to a formal event, but they're both clitorises. <laughs> Would you like me oh, to... Oh, that's me. So that's me as a clitoris. Okay. <laughs> so it's not my clitoris. It's me if I were a clitoris. <laughs> oh, it's a vulva. Sorry, sorry. Me if I were a vulva. And then who's that? Is that Grace if she were a vulva? Black tie. Oh, that's lovely. And also de- very disturbing. So it's, if Grace and I were out in the town... Me with my glasses, her black tie tonight. But the only thing that was different is that we were edible vulvas. <laughs> Pink, sparkly, edible vulvas. Other than that, it would just be a normal Monday night for me and Grace. But it's like a body swap movie made by Rob Schneider <laughs> where we t- accidentally turned into edible vulvas. I- it could happen. I'm s- I certainly hope Rob Schneider's not listening. <laughs> That's. Can you look oh. at that? <laughs> Suffragette, but make it burlesque. Emmeline Spankhurst. Oh, it's is Emmeline it, Spankhurst. Well, see, oh, oh Emmeline, I because fancy that's right. That. Is that because in Sydney you listen to the show? Where someone had a burlesque character called Emily, Emmeline Spankhurst. Those, oh. And she's got nipple tassels and she's got a paddle for spanking. Actually... But she's also saying votes for women. It's Kinky really voting. quality icing work. In... The nipple tassels are incredible. Like, what's the, is How that? That's, not, that? A, um, Didn't you that's not a royal them? icing. Have you three dimensioned a royal icing? Wow. wow. Have you, did, <laughs> didn't you used to host Bake Off? Yes, the British Australian Bake Off. So you, you must know how good that is. It's very good. <laughs> I'll be sending Maggie Beer a photo. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like next time we come to Perth, we want a third, a third cake baker in the, in the mix. In the, no, you're saying no. Oh, this says open after the show, but I'm so intrigued. Oh, I must open it later. What is it? It's what? Oh, okay. I know what it is. Yeah. Um, no, don't be sorry. We love talking about Cal, and uh, we cry about Cal all the time, and it makes me feel good when I cry about Cal, because it's like she's with me. So it's a sort of sad... We've already been crying out the back about Cal, haven't we? Yeah, Deb just keeps going. I'm just exfoliating <laughs> when she cries. It is. Yeah, it's an emotional it's an exfoliation. emotional exfoliation. It is. It's very important. We've had the most incredible tour, and I feel like Cal has been with us all the way. And we started in Christchurch, which is her hometown, and we didn't know to the end of the show. I thought she was with us massively. If you don't know, um, Cal Wilson uh, is, you know, uh, it's hard to say was, because I feel like she's still with us, but she was the most extraordinary comedian and the most wonderful human being. And she used to tour The Guilty Feminist with me a lot, and she was exceptionally good friends with Claire and she died very suddenly last year, very surprisingly, in her early 50s. So we've, uh, yeah, we've, we've all been grieving her this a lot. This was Deborah's first, um, my first tour, with tour down under without Cal. And she would always do at least 50% of your co-hosting shows. She so. would, she would. And we, we had such... She really hulked chemistry. them. She would love that. She would love that. And I, I, we, we did her first show in Christchurch, and we could, it was hard to get a venue in Christchurch. 
And uh, so we, and we had this beautiful theatre, but it was only at the end, and we talked about Cal a lot because it was her hometown, it was the first show of the tour, and at the end people came out of the audience and said, you know this theatre is attached to Cal's old high school and this is where she learned to do drama. And we just like felt her so much there. And I've got a locket that my husband gave me with our pictures in it. And I've got a peg with me that uh, Chris, her husband, gave me because many of you will know one of her seminal I'm a feminist butts was I'm a feminist but my side quest is to find the perfect peg. <laughs> and so people would bring pegs to the show until she found the one she thought was best. Um, so if it's okay, I'm really like to open this now because I like Cal being with us through the show as well. And if we cry, we cry. We, crying is good. Crying is feminist. Um, so I wondered what it was when it was open and after the show. I thought maybe it was drugs or <laughs> something like that. Which also you're very welcome to bring um, Perth. I mean, let's be honest, in Melbourne they bring meth backstage. Shaped into... <laughs> Shaped in tin for, yeah, like little, you know, like um, <laughs> cervix or something like that. You know. <laughs> this is a, a card that says fuck, and then it ticked that. There's options, fuck me, fuck this, fuck it, fuck off, fuck off and die, etc. Fuck the, the horse she ready it on, but they've ticked that. Um, oh. You can read it after. Um, do I read it after? You don't have to read it at once. Is that what you want? Good luck. Good luck with reading that out. Yep. Dear Deb, Grace and Claire, we all felt like we knew Cal and we didn't realise how much we adored her, how adored she was until she was gone. I only met her so briefly and I'm so sad that she's no longer here. I can only begin to imagine how devastated you all are. The tribute to Dick Cal was such a generous gift. I cried ugly tears as I listened to... I've stopped being able to read. To, as I listened to your beautiful stories. Thank you. Thank you, Jet Mag Mama. thinking she's going to come back though I keep thinking every time I come over here I'm like well she'll just be here this time it will be different you know? there were so many stages during Melbourne Comedy Festival that um, I was so used to her working out on especially the upfront upfront is at Melbourne Town Hall and it's um it's an all women and non-binary lineup and it's a gl glorious night in the middle of Melbourne Comedy Festival and um I did the first You're not holding the microphone. <laughs> um, so it's lots of biscuits and they're made in the shape of pegs. Oh. And in the middle, there's this, oh, this um, toot toot chugga chugga because um, yeah. the Ali wiggles. McGregor son. How do you even work back to explain Big how red that? car from, is it called Big Red Car? Yeah, it's um, toot toot oh, chugga yeah. chugga big red car. It yeah. was a long... It was a long story. It was a long riff on Wiggles yeah. porn. She had she had riffed in a show in New Zealand the idea of the Wiggles be, have being sexual beings, and we just it was just some banter between us. But she started riffing names of Wiggles songs um, that uh, you know that, that could be sexy or you know changing them to sounding a bit porny. So at her celebration of her life, Guilty Feminist, that we did in December, that you clearly very kindly listened to, um, Ali McGregor sang Big Red Car, but like it was a sort of sexy, sultry, <laughs> horny club number, which was wonderful. And Cal would have loved it so much. And I feel like wherever she is, wherever her energy is, she did love it. And so this, is, this will be massively treasured, and I don't think I'll ever eat them. I think I'm going to frame... Is it, will, it, will cockroaches come if I frame it? <laughs> home because I love this so much this is this is definitely coming with us on the whole tour this is beautiful absolutely beautiful thank you so much and thank you and I'm really glad we opened it now I'm really really glad we opened it now um so normally now I'd say do you want to hear some stand-up comedy but that's quite hard for Paul Claire isn't it 
So let's just briefly go back to mocking Matt. Can I? Um, just to lift our spirits. Um, can I? Do you know? I um. When I was when I was prepping for this show, when you invi- invited me to be part of it, I was trying to remember when was the first time I met you. Like I, and it was um. I just wanted. The first time I met Deborah Francis White, I was already a fan of the podcast. So it was exciting. And I got to fly. I think I, somebody might have fallen out of it. I flew to Adelaide last minute to do the show. And I simply... What's amazing is today you sort of apologise for being so incredibly overtired. And, um, and I was like, no, nah, this is nothing. You were so jet-lagged when I met you in Adelaide. And what you said was, I have two hours for a nap. If I don't get up, I can't remember what time you said, I think it was three o'clock. If you don't get up by t- three o'clock, make sure I get up. And I went, so nice to meet you, Deborah Francis White. <laughs> now she, so we were staying in the same Airbnb and you headed to bed to get as much sleep as you could possibly get, two hours of sleep. And then I was like, oh my God, I've got it. I've got to make sure I wake up Deborah Francis White at three. Sure enough, three o'clock. Oh, she, oh no, she hasn't woken up. And I had, to, I, had to, I had to open the door to Deborah Francis White's room and be like, oh, my God, I'm going to Deborah Francis White's room. And then I had to come over to your bed and I had to go, excuse me, Deborah Francis White. <laughs> and I had to rouse you from... I had to, I had to meet somebody who I'd only... I'd only ever experienced as the extraordinary host of one of my favourite podcasts and I had to, like, push you gently on the shoulder until you woke up. I had no idea, A, that you gave any fucks at all. I just thought you were this incredibly successful, famous Australian comedian off the telly that I was lucky to get to work with. And I can't believe I made you do an alarm clock duty as soon as I met you. What kind of fucking diva does that? By the way, darling, you're now the tour manager. Wake me up. Like, what was I thinking? I must have been very jet-lagged. Well, you were so well, sleepy. Yeah, I was. I was. And I, I, but no, no, I'm not, I'm not jet-lagged now. I just, I just stayed up very late writing a book yes. that you're going to read in next April because it takes a year to... Yeah. Um, I finished it in Perth. So when you read it, it's called Six Conversations We're Scared to Have. It now takes a year to copy edit and get the legals and do the book cover and all of that and the marketing. So in next April, hopefully I'll come back and, and uh, I'll sign some copies or something. But you'll all know that I saw the Perth sunset. I have pictures of it. It's so beautiful because I didn't go to bed last night. And I saw the sunset come in and it was absolutely stunning. So you will know I finished. I put that book to bed in Perth. Perth, I really, really love you. Um, uh, thank you so much for having us already. This has been hilarious, wonderful, brilliant, loving, feminist, gorgeous and sad and all the things it could have possibly been, melancholy and sentimental. Um, and we've not even through the first act. So now, please allow me to say, would you like to see some stand-up comedy? Then please welcome to the stage, Nick Rebecca Hooper! So our theme tonight... I believe is what we reveal and I was um, I talked to big talk to Deb about some really intense stuff I was going to talk about about how you conceal how left-wing you are by pretending to be center left so that you can spread more messages to a wider or whatever <laughs> I've, I've only got seven minutes I don't have time for that it's good to be back in Perth it's um, good to come back four months after the summer This past summer, I spent um, five weeks with my husband and two children living in my mum and dad's granny flat in Perth. And um, I, we survived, but I will, for the rest of my life, be triggered by the words, knock, knock. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the sound of knocking. That's the sound of my mum saying, knock, knock. <laughs> She's already in. <laughs> it's already in the granny flat. Already in my head. <laughs> At one point, um, she's a very generous woman, at one point over the summer, um, as she was paying for breakfast, she turned to me and went, Claire, I hope it's not embarrassing you. 
that I'm paying for everything. <laughs> I hadn't noticed. <laughs> I'm just a 47-year-old woman letting her mum pay for everything. <laughs> you made this monster. <laughs> my, dad, um, my dad doesn't pay for breakfast and he doesn't say knock-knock um, or I love you or, <laughs> or I might come to your show. Um, but yeah, he doesn't say knock knock. On one of the last days of summer, he walked into the granny flat already in the middle of telling me something. But, 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 but. And what he would have seen was me sitting on a chair grabbing my youngest child and wrapping her around my body. And he looked at me and went, needed a hug, did she? Because he's heard of emotions. I'm keen to see if he spotted one in the flesh. But here's the thing. I hadn't had a top on, so I was wearing her as a shirt. <laughs> and it had been a long summer, so I found myself saying, I don't have a top on, I'm wearing her as a shirt. <laughs> and my, my dad, bless him, just kept telling me whatever he was telling me, but f flicked his head to the ceiling. If I ever want to steal his wallet, I'm coming at him in the nude. <laughs> He'll be powerless to fight me off. I won't need to steal his wallet. My mum pays for everything. <laughs> anyway, Perth is where I grew up. It's where I learned to be a grown-up. And every time I come back, I feel myself regressing. I remember being a teenager and looking at growing up and thinking, that looks terrible. And now that I'm here, I was right. <laughs> because you feel the same, but you're not allowed to show what you're feeling as much. Like, think about it. When you're a little kid and you fall over in the street, you're allowed to cry until everybody's paying attention. When you're grown up and you fall over in the street, you have to just get up, act like you're fine, and you don't get to cry until you've moved cities. <laughs> Being a grown up is about not showing how you feel. I had forgotten about Perth. Over summer, I really had to acclimatise quickly. I'd forgotten, I'd forgotten how Perth, um, how the harshness of the sun burns my skin and how my dad's harshness burns my heart. <laughs> yeah, I had to acclimatise so quickly. I remember getting on the plane in Melbourne, thinking a really Melbourne thought, maybe this is the summer I tell my dad I love him. <laughs> I got off the plane a few hours later in Perth and I took my first deep breath of the dry air that surrounds my father and I went, I reckon he knows. <laughs> No need to tell him you love him. <laughs> Save that for your Melbourne dad. <laughs> That's what I call my barista. <laughs> Eight flat white Paul, love you. <laughs> no, don't tell my dad you love him. This is, this, is, um, this is my dad. He's a nice man, but in the 40 years that my folks have owned a pool, he's never been in the pool because... <laughs> The pool was your mum's idea. <laughs> Think he's ready to bathe in the cool, refreshing waters of my emotional intimacy? No, I tell him I love him and he'll jump in that pool for the first time and never surface again. <laughs> no, he's a good man. He doesn't, he doesn't, um, doesn't really, um, doesn't use my name very often. Like every now and then he'll give it a crack, but 50-50 it'll be the dog's name. Be nice to get a pat on the head, wouldn't it? And, and he doesn't say I love you, but he does say things like three mil of rainfall overnight. <laughs> you know, or be quiet, the news is on, and I know what he means. <laughs> Being a grown-up is about not showing what you feel. He asked me to go cycling with him. So 
This was big. I was like, I guess this is his love language. I went out cycling with him and I'm proud to say he did not go kind on me. (laughs) He is, what's that? Yeah, he was born in 1945. Sorry, yes, that's right. He's 80 next year and he absolutely destroyed me. And when he asked me back the next week, he was like, do you want to go again? I was like, you know what? I'm young, I'm fit, I'm a fast learner. I'm going to show him what I made of this time. And then, (laughs) do you know what? He went even harder. Turns out he had been going kind on me. (laughs) Turns out that's how my dad says I love you, by only destroying me with 50% of his powers. (laughs) And also when he got a full kilometre ahead, he would stop and turn to check I was still following. (laughs) And you know, when we came to a really busy road, he knew I was too wobbly to look left and right, so he'd check for oncoming traffic and if it was safe to cross, he'd yell, clear! (laughs) Which is almost a conversation. (laughs) In fact, if I don't listen too closely, it's almost like he's calling my name. Anyway, do I what? I, t- I love my dad, but do I have to tell him I love him? Like, how is the best way to show him I love him? Is it by saying I love you when that's not something he wants? Or is it by waiting until I go back to Melbourne um, and say it in my stand-up comedy show, which is surprisingly more about my dad than I expected, <laughs> where he won't have to hear it? <laughs> So, so yeah, it was a bit more about my dad than I expected this year. And um, I, had a, I was in Perth and Perth Fringe was on, so I had a couple of runs at the show just, just to check that it was working. And I um, accidentally, I didn't look at the dates, and I accidentally booked my flight home with my family for um, the morning uh, of my last performance at the show. So I put my family on the flight. I was like, good luck, I'll be there soon. I booked a flight for two hours after the show and I said to my mum and dad, can you please give me a lift to the theatre after the show because I never stop taking. (laughs) um, I said, give me a lift to the airport after my show and they were like, yeah, yeah. My dad went, I might come and see your show. (laughs) And I went, no, 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 just... Just after the show, give me a lift to the airport. And he went, no, 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 your mum and I will come and see the show and then go straight to the airport from there. And I pretended to be fine with that because being a grown-up's about not showing what you feel. (laughs) And so I went to my last show in the back seat of my mum and dad's car. (laughs) And then I did the show. And then we drove to the airport... Quietly. (laughs) Dropped my bag off, got to the security gates and as I said goodbye to my parents to uh, go through those gates, get on that plane, fly home to my family in Melbourne. My dad cleared his throat and he went, we do love you. (laughs) I do. And I said, nothing. Because <laughs> being a grown-up's about not showing them how you feel. Thank you so much. Buddy! Hello, Guilty Feminist. This is Deborah. I've got a quick few announcements for you. On Monday, the 15th of July, we're back at King's Place with what promises to be an amazing show featuring exclusive previews from some of our favourite Guilty Feminist regulars who are bringing new shows to the Edinburgh Fringe. You can hear from Kate Checker, Zoe Brownstone, Jessica Regan, Alison Spittle and Sarah Barron. And in the second half, Kiri pritchard McLean and I will be talking to the CEO of the Fostering Network. Sarah Thomas and the amazing poet Lem Sisse. 
And then we'll be heading to the Edinburgh Fringe ourselves with three shows at the Gilded Balloon on the 12th, 13th and 14th of August. For more information on all these shows and to book tickets, go to guiltyfeminist.com and click on live shows. If you want an ad-free version of the podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash guiltyfeminist or you can subscribe via Apple Podcasts or Acast Plus. And if you're enjoying this episode, why not write us a review and give us five stars wherever you're listening. It helps other people find the podcast. And now, back to the show. Okay. Our next guest is a proud Yusufzai Pashtun woman who is an award-winning theatre maker, poet and activist. Her works delve into themes of vulnerability, connection and belonging, offering a unique perspective from her intersectional identities as a neurodivergent woman, sovereign tribal person and feminist of faith. She has made extraordinary uh, theatre shows here in Australia and she is an alumna of the Black Swan Emerging Writers Group. Have we got some Black Swan people in tonight? Excellent. Um, They're theatre people, so they just go, yes. Um, Her contributions have cemented her reputation as a true emerging voice. Uh, Could you please put your hands together and make incredible woohooing noises for Doray Shava Khan? The <laughs> Delta Satotolum Mascherano, Mendo Huendo, and as a matter of the Stare Mache. Hudeta Satolo, Azad, or Bad Sati. Good evening, Borlu. My name is Dora Shabar Khan. I'm an Isab Say, Pashtun woman on my father's side, and a proud Afridi mother on my grandmother's side. And today, as we meet here in this beautiful place, not far from the Durbal Yerrigan, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on Sovereign Wajaknunga Buja. I'd like to acknowledge their elders, past and present. I'd like to acknowledge their matriarchy, and I'd like to send respects from my elders to theirs. I'd also like to acknowledge all First Nation people in this room. I'd like to acknowledge every person in this room, your elders, your matriarchs. Welcome. It was very difficult to decide which poem to choose um, when I was asked to be part of this show. And so I did what any feminist would do. I asked my mother. (laughs) And I asked my theater mother, um, a very strong feminist woman by the name of Susie Conte. And they decided that the best poem to read on tonight's occasion would be from the work Moor, which is Pashto for mother. And in a way, it's an ode to mothers, but also in a way, to daughters. Now, because I have terrible ADHD, I did try to memorize this poem for you, but that did not go very well. So I have sheets of paper, which I stapled to my diary because I knew I'd lose it because I have ADHD. I will now join you all in the ceremonious ripping of the sheets of paper from my diary, where it was stapled lovingly by my husband, so I would not lose it. That's the first sheet. I think there's two more. (laughs) Now, don't be worried. It's in large font because I also have really terrible eyesight, but I've lost my glasses because I have ADHD. (laughs) Something's telling me that this is a very common occurrence in this group. (laughs) Right. So this poem was originally in Pashto, and because it's a language that's spoken then by less people, then I think it's like 5% of the population, a very small percentage of Pakistan's population speaks this language. It's in English, so people would understand it. I was the firstborn child of two firstborn children. 
the firstborn child of two first-time parents. As the firstborn child will tell you, we are our parents' first real science experiment. We answer their questions like, how long can we survive without sleep? How much vomit does a baby contain? Is this poop on my clothes? I was the firstborn daughter of the firstborn daughter of the mother who hung up a white lab coat in exchange for a white with a red wedding dress. Her bedtime repertoire included a Rapunzel who cut her own hair and fled the tower to start a hair salon. Now, so far as I'm concerned, that's exactly how the story goes. Fight me. I was the firstborn daughter of the firstborn daughter of the firstborn daughter. And as any good legacy firstborn daughter would tell her therapist, several sessions in, legs crossed in lotus, cup of tea in hand, pinky out, thank you, we unburden several generations for the price of one. <laughs> I'm the firstborn daughter of two firstborn children, firstborn daughter of two first-time migrants, mechanically filling out forms on baby pink Helvetica dotted websites, you know the ones. Peddling trauma punctuated in poetic gold leaf to arts organizations in Perth. Ticking diversity boxes sometimes feels like holding up a digital beggar bowl. All the while, I'm seeking answers to questions like, how long before I receive a callback? How long do you suppose I can put off paying my phone bill? How long can I wear this mask to make ends meet for the cat's sake before I hit critical burnout? Yes, I was that firstborn daughter of the firstborn daughter. And any firstborn daughter will tell you, we are our mother's first knitting project. We are slip stitches and ambitious designs, lovingly misshapen, raveled and unraveled. My mother herself was the firstborn daughter of the firstborn daughter, who lovingly knit her granddaughter's sweaters that never made it past border control. I imagine the soft pink smoke in the incinerator billowing up Borlu's skies. I look up and I think of the mother who knitted me out of the best parts of her own beribboned DNA. I was the firstborn daughter of the firstborn daughter, and at four I first saw my mother's cry. My bendy knees and rubber band joints, a bouncy brown bambi on home soil. It pierced my baby fat heart to the core, seeing diamonds nestled in downy brown lashes. Her bird bone shoulders wrapped in a shawl of velvety despair. She was mechanically fixing me breakfast in imaginary scrubs. I'm the firstborn daughter of the firstborn daughter. At 34, post and simultaneously mid-pandemic, that same dark shawl enveloped my now desperate shoulders. As I cowered in a cafe on Beaufort Street, I could barely afford just to steal their Wi-Fi. I'm the firstborn daughter of the firstborn daughter. My cleverest baby, my mother cooed at 18 when I ventured out into the world. You're not finished yet, she said as she knotted me at the seams. She feared sharp teeth and claws would be my unraveling. My cleverest baby, my mother coos, and now I'm 38. I once again find myself unraveling, worse for wear. Put your mind at ease, for these uncast ends will navigate labyrinths and they will always always lead me back to you. For you see, I'm the oldest daughter of the oldest daughter, this time imagining a different life for my one day oldest daughter. While sipping badly burnt coffee on Beaufort Street this morning, and I was imagining what I would say when I came into a room as big as this to all the firstborn daughters a secret feminist fight club. The first rule being, today we talk about this fight club. <laughs> firstborn daughters of firstborn daughters, do you hear me? 
I said, do you hear me? Firstborn daughters of firstborn daughters, today I saw in that cup before me the full $4.23. My mother's loving eyes staring back at me. And I was momentarily struck by the beauty that she had lent me. So I want you all to raise your cups of overpriced coffee for the firstborn daughters of the firstborn daughters and the ones that will one day become mothers to these firstborn daughters, the generational wounds, your tempered dreams, the stubborn streak they like to call resilience. We call this resistance. This, this is the legacy of your firstborn daughters. This is the umbilical cord between generations of women that the world will never sever. Doresha Bakan, everybody! Absolutely glorious. And we will see you in the second half right on the sofa. That was incredible. To close our first half, I dare not come to Australia without her now um, because people would throw things and boo. Uh, put your hands together, make incredible hooing noises for the wonderful Grace Petrie! <laughs> Shout if you've ever been to Ikea. This one's for you. <laughs> it's Wednesday evening in Ikea. There's just two kinds of people here. And in my life, I have been both. The new teams at the starting line, committing to each room design like it was a permanent oath. But that's not me I know these aisles You can spot the ones like me for miles Now there's no good-natured arguments on taste I have no need to compromise them. There's no one saying we've been here too long And I get exactly what I want It's Wednesday evening in Ikea And everywhere I look in here A new team's trying to make themselves mad But those couples sharing meatball tea Don't notice all the ghosts like me Back here alone And starting from scratch But spare a thought But for the grace Of ever disassembling shared space Now there's no good-natured arguments on tape I have no need of compromise these days There's no negotiations to concede And I get exactly what I need What I need And to those optimistic lovers Picking duvet covers I wish them all the best From the bottom of my chest And if they follow the instructions There's no reason their constructions Really shouldn't last But who am I to ask? Because mine all fell apart And I'm right back at the start Just hoping I've not lost Any fundamental parts And I'm sure that I'll remember How it all fits back together Because I know I'm not inadequately skilled it's just that some things take two people to build. It's Wednesday evening in Ikea. There's just two kinds of people here. And in my life, I have been both. 
Thank you very much, Bud. We'll see you after the break. So that was the first half. Join us for part two, which should be in your feed right now.